Hey, hey everybody, I hope you're doing well today. I just want to take a second to invite you to check out my new project, bradcartwright.com. I have created a resource for you as you head to the May 2020 exams. If you're an IB student, an AP student, head on over to bradcartwright.com where you will find video lessons, notes, slides, key terms, practice questions, and other key components to make you feel good before you go to bed before the test, all right? So head to bradcartwright.com, create a new free account. You don't need a credit card to create the account. Check out the free previews and use the coupon code MAY2020 to receive a discount. And just to give you an idea of what it's like over there, check out the following video. Now let's take a look at what exactly are the six stages of economic integration, which is a process of going from just kind of friends, just like a couple that just meets one another all the way up through like complete and total integration. And of course, I've told you in the last video, like that's like talking about like a couple totally merging their lives, right? And becoming one as a married couple. Okay. So we'll go through them one by one. Um, there's a lot of notes that are going to come up on the, on the slide next to me here. And that's because I want you to be able to see them. Also, you know, they're in the notes that, if, that are associated with this video. And also you have these slides down below. So if you just want to listen, that might be an effective way um, of, of watching this video as well. Okay. So the first two stages um, are preferential trade areas and free trade areas. Okay. So preferential trade areas, what does that mean? It's abbreviated with PTA. They are a trading block that gives preferential access to certain products from certain countries. Preferential trading agreement, okay? This is usually carried out by reducing but not eliminating, eliminating tariffs. So that might look like, you know, certain goods from one country going to another country have tariffs, but the countries decide like, okay, you know, maybe we'll work something out. So for certain amount of goods, they can come into our country as if they were produced in our country and they would have no barriers to trade or they would have no tariffs associated with them. Okay. An example, and it, it's really important in your studies, like go beyond the examples that I'm going to give here. There are many, and, and certainly the more you understand of the examples, the better it is for your studies. Uh, but an example of a preferential trading area is that between the, uh, the European Union and the African, Caribbean, and Pacific, or ACP, group states. Okay, so they have certain products have no tariffs, but doesn't really go past that. Okay, so that's just a first stage of integration. The second stage of integration would be something that's called a free trade area. And by definition, a free trade area is an agreement between countries where the countries need to trade the countries agreed to trade freely among themselves, but are able to trade with other countries outside of the trade, free trade area in whichever way they wish. Okay. So this is an example. I just, this is from Jocelyn Blink's textbook, excellent econ course, um, companion textbook for the IB curriculum. Um, and what you see here is you basically see country A, country B and country C, and they have a free trade area. And this, a, a real life example of this would be like a free, the free trade agreement between the North American free trade agreement, which is between the United States, Canada, and Mexico. So if you just imagine like Canada, United States, and Mexico, like they operate as a free trade area, but that doesn't exclude them from trading with another country here represented by country D. And all three of them can make their own trade deals with anybody who's not in the free trade area. That's an important distinction as we move into the third stage of economic integration, which is a customs union, which is an agreement between countries where the countries agreed to trade freely among themselves and, and this is how it's different than the previous one or number two, which is free trade areas, they also agree to adopt common external barriers against any country attempting to import into the customs union. So the reason I kind of went right into this one is you can now see, imagine if the North American Free Trade Agreement became a customs union, what would happen is there'd be like this green bubble here, you see that? And that means that in this customs union, country A, B, and C, so Canada, United States, and Mexico, have a free trade area, but also they are forbidden 
to operate independently with a fourth country, in this case, country D, okay? So that's an important distinction because if you become a customs union, you're giving up more freedom, right, by, by tightening your relationship with the countries that are in your free trade agreement. All common markets and economic and monetary unions, which are things we're going to be talking about in a second, are also customs unions, and therefore the EU is a customs union, okay? And that's actually an important point. Like, as we go through these stages, right, we're on three. So as you go one, two, three, four, five, six, you know, six will have all of the characteristics of five, four, three, two, one. Five will have all the characteristics of the ones previous to it, okay? So because they're building, and that makes sense. Like, as you become more and more integrated, you don't stop being integrated in, in one way. Otherwise, it wouldn't be full economic integration when you get to the end, okay? So that's number three, customs union. Number four, the fourth stage of economic integration are common markets. Definition, a common market is a customs union with a common with common policies on product regulation and free movement of goods, services, capital, and most importantly, labor, okay? The European Union is a common market. So labor is critical because that is the thing that differentiates most, at least in my mind, between a customs union and a common market. Why is that? Because when people can move from one country to another and be able to get a job, it eliminates a whole host of hassle, <laughs> both for the people and for businesses that are operating in multiple countries. And as a result of that, it reduces costs. A great example of this, if you, have, if you follow European football at all, you will see that over the course of the last 20 years or so, you'll see a lot more foreign players playing in England or playing in France or playing in Germany from other European Union members. And the reason is that professional football players or professional soccer players, they're labor for the business that is the club. And so as a result of the integration of the European Union, man, it became really easy and effortless for European clubs to sign players from different European nations because they're all part of the same you guessed it, common market, and therefore, there's a free movement of labor. Okay, so that's number four, common markets. Number five, economic and monetary union. This is getting tight, right? Now we got a lot of integration going on, a lot of parts, main parts now of the economies of different nations are becoming aligned and integrated. So, definition. An economic and monetary union is a common market with a common currency and a common central bank. Wow, well that's the European Union right now, okay? So the European Union has, it's a common market, that means it has free movement of goods, services, capital, and labor, but also it has a common currency, of course the Euro, and a common central bank, which is the European Central Bank. That's pretty massive, right? Because all members of the European Union had to give up their abilities to monitor and manage their currency. And think about that. Just think about the previous unit in balance of payments and think about the exchange rates. And all of a sudden, they've given up their ability to incentivize or, or take away the incentive of different parts and different segments of their economy. Remember that you know, there was the export side of their economy, there was the import side of their economy, and depending on the fluctuations of trade between nations, right, they were able to take care of one side or take care of the other. But as countries become part of the European Union, guess what? They give up the ability to control the very thing that may or may not attract them other countries um, from trading with them. So it's pretty big. It's actually really, really big. Okay, so that's the European Union. And of course, the best economic and monetary union is the Eurozone, which includes the members of the European Union that have adopted the Euro as their currency and have the European Central Bank as their central bank. It's a bit repetitive. Okay, so that is economic and monetary union is the fifth stage of economic development. And the last one is complete economic integration, okay? And this is the final stage of economic integration at which point the individual countries involved would have zero control over economic policy, full monetary union, and a complete harmonization of fiscal policy. 
Wow, this is what the Eurozone is moving towards. If you want to understand all of this in like what it means to complete economic integration, this is, a, this is the best example I can come up with. If you can picture a map of the United States, of the 48 states within the United States, right, plus Hawaii and plus Alaska, if you think of them as 50 different countries that have agreed, right, there are 50 states, 50 different countries, think of them as countries, that have agreed to complete fiscal monetary policy integration, you have an example of stage six, which is the complete and total economic integration of multiple nations, okay? So what does that mean? It means that, you know, anybody can drive from New York to California and go get a job, and they don't need to change their currency. And also that if there's difficult times, say, in Texas, right, the, the central government of the United States or the central bank of this economic, completely integrated group of 50 nations, right, is responsible for fiscal and monetary policy in each one of those 50 states. So that means that those 50 states or 50 countries have given up their ability to even spend money that they collect from their taxpayers. And that is a massive, massive um, concession that must come with a lot of benefits um, in order for them to agree to do that. But if you're wondering what complete economic integration is, the United States if it were 50 separate nations that have agreed to a common um, economic policy, full monetary union, and a complete harmonization of fiscal policy, that's what happens in the United States, okay? So now, lastly, let's take a look at some advantages and disadvantages of different trading blocks, okay? Number one, the extent of the advantages and disadvantages of trading blocks clearly depends on the degree of integration. That seems obvious, right? similar to those of free trade agreements, right? So as free trade agreements become more and more integrated, of course, the advantages become greater, but also guess what? Maybe the disadvantages become greater, right? One of them might, advantages might be a larger market size, right? As you integrate, you have more people who could buy your stuff. Increase foreign investment, hey, yeah. So now, you know, Canada, the United States, and um, Mexico involved in North American free trade agreement can invest in each other's countries more easily and more readily. A trading block will, fo will, fo will foster greater political stability and cooperation. It's interesting, the more economically integrated two places are, the less likely they are to go to war. That's pretty interesting. Um, and so, you know, if you have a lot at stake to invade another country, the more you have at stake to evade another country, the less likely you're going to be able to do it. And if you're economically integrated, why would you go against your own economic interests? Okay? And trade negotiations also will be easier as there will be a larger blocks of countries. So what's that saying is like if the world were to make itself into not, you know, multi, as many nations as, well, if everybody didn't have to make these bilateral agreements with different countries around the world, but rather the world countries were represented by, say, five, six, seven, maybe eight trading blocks, imagine negotiations between eight is much easier than negotiations between 100, okay? So those are the advantages. Disadvantages. Trading blocks favor increased trade among members, but act as a discriminatory, pol discriminatory policy against non-members. You're either in the, on the team or off the team, right? You either in or out. And, and as soon as you start grouping countries together, they can start to have um, this affect of like, oh, well, you know, I'm not one of you, so uh, I got to go find another team, right? So they can be discriminatory in terms of how they trade. They may, be, they may undermine international trade rules and limit the potential gains of trade achievable with freer forms of world trade. And the idea there is that, you know, if economy, if, if countries are more intertwined or interlocked or integrated with other countries, they're less free to make their own deals, and that might actually inhibit free trade. And lastly, this would, of course, is also always more of a problem for smaller or poor economies that have little bargaining power. You know, if you're a large nation, you don't have as much um, trouble making a trade deal with smaller nations. But if you're a small nation, man, and you're not part of a trading block, it could be pretty difficult to make a trade negotiation with a powerful nation, maybe say like Canada or the United States or Australia, right, or the United Kingdom. Um, and, and, and these trading blocks can ostracize certain countries if they're not a member of that particular trading block. 
because now they have to do it all for themselves and they've lost their leverage in negotiations as a result of not being integrated with someone else. Okay, so there are the six stages of economic integration. Again, really helpful if you think about just the common little thing about, you know, two people meet and, and then they move towards marriage. That's what happens with the movement from, you know, uh, preferential trade agreements all the way to complete and total economic integration. All right, and with that video, hopefully you can see how international trade whoo, comes to a nice, complete, closed circle in that we started off right, talking about how free trade works and how protectionism works, and now we're talking about what the total advantages and disadvantages are of economic integration between nations. So we went really pretty deep in this um, analysis and evaluation of international economics. All right, my friends, take care of yourselves, and we'll talk to you in a bit. <laughs>